The plugin that I'm going to talk about today has the potential to completely disrupt the music production world, and I'm not exaggerating. I'm talking about a plugin that brings the Dolby Atmos workflow to any digital audio workstation out there. Stereo or multi-channel, Mac or Windows, doesn't matter. No compromises, a workflow almost identical to the traditional Dolby Atmos workflow, features that the Adobe Atmos renderer doesn't even have, and most importantly, extremely affordable. So let's dig into it. But first of all, hello everybody. In case you're new here, my name is Michael Wagner. I'm a digital media educator with over 30 years of experience in higher education. And in this channel, I talk about digital media, game design, and spatial audio. If any of those topics interest you, I invite you to subscribe or join my Discord community. In that link is in the description below, or there's also a QR code here somewhere. The plugin I'm going to talk about today is the Dolby Atmos Composer from Fiedler Audio. Now, at the time I'm recording this video, this plugin was not yet officially available. I'm actually working with the pre-release version here, so just keep that in mind. At the time of the release, the plugin will be available in two different versions, a full version and essential version. If you're just starting out with Dolby Atmos, the essential version will be fine, so you're not going to miss out on any important features. However, uh, be aware that uh, in this video, I'm actually going to work with the full version. I'm going to mention whenever I use a feature that is actually only available in the full version. In case you're not familiar with Fiddle Audio, they are known for their plugins and solutions in the immersive and spatial audio space. In particular for their reverb plugin, which is called Spacelab. Now, Spacelab also comes in two different versions, an ignition version and an interstellar version. The interesting thing about Spacelab is that it will be... Uh, you will be able to use that in conjunction with the Dolby Atmos Composer. So you will be able to use Spacelab as a reverb that feeds into a Dolby Atmos bad track. And that's actually fairly interesting. So, and I'm, and I'm actually going to show you towards the end of this video on how that will work. However, be aware that at the time of the release of the Dolby Atmos Composer, that integration has not yet been released. So you will need an update to the Spacelab plugin in order to make that work. I, however, have an access to uh, an early beta version and Fiedler allowed me to actually show you how that works. And it's actually fairly neat. And it uh, it makes things a lot easier than uh, working with other reverbs, to be perfectly honest. Now, in preparing this video, I thought a lot about what digital audio workstation I should use for this video, because the Dolby Atmos Composer works with any of them. And I ended up settling for FL Studio. Now, why FL Studio? Well, first of all, why not? Second of all, there were actually a couple of people asking me if it is possible to create Dolby Atmos with FL Studio, and the answer now is yes, it is, if you're using the Dolby Atmos Composer. And third, um, it's actually one of those digital audio workstations that is rather unlikely to be usable in a Dolby Atmos workflow. First of all, it is stereo only and can't really do multi-channel. And second, uh, it is primarily used on Windows and Dolby Atmos workflows are traditionally tied to the Dolby Atmos renderer, which unfortunately is really only available for uh, Mac systems. So it's actually an unlikely uh, candidate and I felt that might be a good candidate for this video. Now, even though I'm working with FL Studio for this video, the workflow that I'm going to use is completely identical to any other digital audio workstation. So if you're on Studio One or Ableton or Bitwig or whatever, um, you should be able to follow along and just do the same things that I'm doing in FL Studio and your digital audio workstation. I've even tried it with something like Plogue Bidule. So if you're somebody who is producing Ambisonics with Plogue Bidule, you can also use the Dolby Atmos Composer in order to convert the Ambisonics into Dolby Atmos. Works just as fine. And finally, a couple of disclaimers. Fiddler Audio provided me with a not for resale license for the Dolby Atmos Composer and access to the pre release version. And they also provided me uh, with access to the beta version of Spacelab. I already had a license for Spacelab, so I didn't get a license for that. It wasn't necessary. However, this is not a sponsored video. Anything that I'm going to say is strictly my own opinion. If I seem excited, this is because I am excited and uh, nobody had any say uh, in terms of what I'm going to talk about and nobody is going to see this video before it's going to be released. And with that being said, let's get right into our little FL Studio project. Now, for those of you who have been watching my channel for quite some time, you guys know that I like to use very simple projects. And the reason for that is because I want to focus on the workflow. And I sometimes feel that the complex projects, even though they sound nice, uh, might actually distract from the actual kind of uh, main concepts of the workflow itself. So I like to use very simple things. Here I have a very simple groove and a synthesizer. It's uh, an instance of uh, Dune 
tune and uh, I'm using one of those one finger presets. So it actually sounds a lot more interesting than the MIDI clip might indicate. Now, if you are a passionate and um, you know kind of uh, experienced FL Studio user, be aware that I'm not a daily FL Studio user. I have some experience with it, but there might be shortcuts that I don't know. So if you're sitting behind the screen uh, screaming at me because I'm not using a certain shortcut, I apologize. This is something that I essentially not use on a daily basis. So let's have a brief listen on how that uh, little clip actually sounds. So essentially we have uh, a kick, a clap, a snare, and then this little synth. And what we're going to do is we're going to convert that into a Dolby Atmos project uh, and we're going to export that uh, in Dolby Atmos with a 7.1.2 bed um, in full glory and uh, in a way that is very, very similar to a traditional Dolby Atmos workflow. So let's get started. Now, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to put an instance of the Dolby Atmos composer on the master channel. So uh, let's just open up the... Um, slot here and let's add the Dolby Atmos Composer. Now if you are opening the Dolby Atmos Composer for the first time you might actually see uh, a, uh, a little error here and that error indicates that there are certain settings that need to be changed that are not uh, set correctly and uh, if I click on that area I actually see what the problem is and in this particular case the sample rate of the session doesn't match. Uh, now if you are not familiar with Dolby Atmos you need to be aware that Dolby Atmos requires a certain sample rate. It can be either 48 kilohertz or uh, six, 96 kilohertz. Now depending on what version of the Dolby Atmos composer you're using you're going to have access to either the 48 kilohertz or both. Now in my particular case because I'm using the full version I have access to both but in order for it to actually work I first need to set the uh, settings the sample settings in FL Studio to 48 kilohertz so I'm going to get in here and I'm going to switch that over to 48 and that will actually require me to reopen the project so let's open that up again and uh, once I have that essentially the error is gone and I can start producing my Dolby Atmos stuff now, since many viewers of this video might actually be new to Dolby Atmos, let me just give you a very brief introduction in to what Dolby Atmos actually is and how it really works, because uh, understanding the ins and outs of Dolby Atmos are actually important in order to understand how the Dolby Atmos composer actually works. Now, the basic idea behind Dolby Atmos is that it combines an object-oriented audio format, and by object-oriented, it means that the sounds are considered objects in three-dimensional space that have positional information, and it combines that with a channel-based um, component and this channel based component is called the Dolby Atmos bed. Traditionally Dolby Atmos beds are in 7.1.2 format so those are surround sound uh, systems that have 7.1.2 speaker layouts and they are used in order to uh, ground the Dolby Atmos production. They are sort of the bed that, uh, that kind of embeds the entire immersive experience. An additional advantage of doing it that way also uh, is that it allows Dolby Atmos to be easily, gracefully downgraded to older systems. So for example, if you are producing a Dolby Atmos production and you then later kind of uh, listen to it on a traditional surround sound system, a 7.1 or 5.1 system, because you have that uh, channel layout at the core of the Dolby Atmos bed, it allows the system to downgrade gracefully and you get a really, really good experience. And this also includes downgrading to stereo. So so um, the main appeal of Dolby Atmos really is that it works for pretty much anything from stereo up to however speaker you want because the objects are three-dimensional objects in three-dimensional space. They are not channel-based. So if you have 22, 24, 100 speakers, you could technically or theoretically uh, produce the audio accordingly. Now, if you look at the Dolby Atmos Composer, and uh, the view, by the way, is completely identical to what you would also see in the Dolby Atmos Renderer provided by Dolby Directly, is that you see the first 10 channels in this brownish color, and they are reserved for the bed. Uh, and the bed in the setting, according to the specifications, is by default a 7.1.2 bed, so essentially seven horizontal speakers, an LFE channel, and two overhead speakers. And then you have 180 additional channels for the objects, and each object is a mono object. That essentially means that if you have a stereo track and you move that into an object, or kind of make turn that into an object, 
then you have essentially two objects, an object pair, one object for the left channel and one object for the right channel. And uh, Dolby Atmos really is just about uh, balancing these things out. So essentially trying to figure out what you move into the Dolby Atmos bed and what you actually use in order to turn that into an object in order to create a better spatial experience. And this is what we're going to do with our little project here. A couple of things about the user interface before we go into any details. Uh, first of all, uh, what we can do is we can change the output settings so we can change whatever speaker layout we are working with. And uh, the uh, Adobe Atmos Composer works with speaker layouts up to 9.1.6. So even though FL Studio can't really do multi-channel, what we could do, for example, is we could hook that up uh, to a 9.1.6 speaker system and uh, use the Dolby Atmos Composer in, in order to turn any production that we have in FL Studio or any other digital audio workstation into something that we can actually listen to in a fully immersive speaker setup. Now, what we're going to do here, I'm actually going to leave that off uh, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to listen to everything through headphones. And if you're using headphones, be aware there are two options that you have. You can either listen to it in stereo or you can listen to it in binaural. Binaural essentially means that it tries to recreate the immersive experience using headphones. So it it, it tries to take into consideration your, your head geometry, your hearing system, and uh, essentially uses something that's called a head-related transfer function in order to convert the uh, audio into something that sounds as if you would listen to it in an immersive audio environment. You can either, once again, turn that into stereo or you can uh, leave that in binaural. I'm going to use binaural in this uh, video, so if you are listening to this video on regular stereo speakers or on a, uh, an iPhone, for example, be aware that certain things might sound a little bit weird because it is actually meant to be listened to with headphones. A couple of other things that you can do in this interface. First of all, you can add a personalized head-related transfer function. So if you have something like that, you can add that here. You can add external outputs. I'm not going to do that here because I haven't hooked it up to any external speaker system. And uh, depending on what version you have, you will also see additional options in uh, in the full version here. I see kind of the loudness measurements and I can uh, kind of uh, decide what kind of things I want to measure. So this is sort of the main interface. There's an export uh, sec section here. I'm going to talk about that once we get to the actual export. Uh, and then we have additional options here um, In if we go to the options tab. And this will actually look differently depending on whether or not you have the full version or the essential version. This gives you a couple of uh, things that you can set in terms of down mix. Uh, you can uh, define groups. Um, if you're working with Dolby Atmos, what you sometimes do is that you uh, essentially define what groups certain objects belong to and that allows you to kind of work with them as groups. So this can be useful. Uh, you can also uh, change the frame rate. This is something that might become important if you're producing your Dolby Atmos to be later married with a video, for example. For most of the applications in Dolby Atmos Music, this is a fairly irrelevant kind of value. Uh, and then essentially you have a couple of options for the export, and I'm going to talk about that once we get to that. And with that being said, let's route some tracks into the Dolby Atmos Composer as objects as well as bad tracks and uh, the way this is usually done is through panning devices. Now if you're working with Pro Tools for example or if you're working with any other digital audio workstation that is multi-channel on a, on a Mac, what you usually use is uh, what's called the Dolby Atmos Music Panner. And uh, here we have something very similar and it's called the Dolby Atmos Beam plugin. So let's uh, add that to our tracks. Now I should probably mention that as soon as I put the Dolby Atmos Composer onto the master channel, I will no longer hear any audio. And the reason for that is because I only hear the audio that is coming out of the Dolby Atmos Composer plugin. And since I currently don't have anything routed into the Dolby Atmos Composer, I'm actually not hearing anything. So if I'm playing the sound, essentially, you will essentially see that nothing is actually reaching the Composer and nothing therefore is also reaching my headphones. In order to actually get some sound in there, what I need to do is I need to add the Dolby Atmos Beam plugin to my tracks uh, and let's first add one to the kick track here so let's just open up this slot and let's add an instance of Dolby Atmos Beam and as soon as I put that on there I see that in the Dolby Atmos Composer it has identified that there is actually a, an instance of the Dolby Atmos Beam plugin here in the Dolby Atmos Beam plugin I have the possibility to um, 
position my sound accordingly. So there is a panel here that allows me to essentially change the position of the sound. I'm going to come back to that in a second. And I can actually switch that from the three pin to a, to, a, to a top view or to a side view to get a better understanding about how these sounds are located. Um, now I'm going to come back to that in a second, but let's just first have a listen on if we're actually getting some sound. And indeed I do. And what I currently see is that this uh, kick is routed into the bad channels, into the bad track, as left and right channels. So I currently don't really have any panning going on, but if I, for example, move these uh, speakers around, what will essentially happen is that additional channels are going to come in in the uh, bad track here. So let me just kind of maybe make that a little wider and let's maybe kind of move that up a little just for the just for the fun of it. And that will essentially kind of make sure that there is additional information coming in on the center channel and some of the height and surround channels. So if I'm adding a Dolby Atmos Beam plugin to one of the tracks, uh, it's going to send the track into the Dolby Atmos Composer as a uh, part of the Dolby Atmos bed by default, but I can actually change how that is sent. So let's have a look on what I can do with that. The first thing that I can do in the Dolby Atmos Beam user interface is I can change the panning mode of the track and it is set to composite by default and I can switch it over to objects. Now, I should probably mention what a composite is uh, because Fiedler does not really use the term Dolby Atmos bad, but instead uses the term composite. The reason they're doing that is because the composite is a little bit more general than a Dolby Atmos bad. Um, if you remember, I said that Adobe Atmos Bed is by default a 7.1.2 track. What Fiddler decided to do is provide a little bit more flexibility. So I can actually change the layout of the bed track as a Fiddler composite into something that's a little bit more general. So for example, I can switch it over to a 9.1.6 track. And if I do that, you will actually see in the Adobe Atmos Composer that it is now allocated the first 16 channels for this um, for this uh, composite or for this bed. Now the way this really works is uh, it follows a trick that many producers have been using and that is essentially that they are using the bed channels for their regular speaker layout and then they are adding objects manually that kind of uh, represent the uh, speakers that are missing. And Fiedler essentially uh, provided us with an opportunity to do that automatically. So if you're choosing a composite that is a 9.1.6, what it will eventually do is it will use the bed channels, the 10 bed channels, and then and then add additional objects to make up the full 16 speakers. Now, the other option that you have is you can switch that over to objects. And if you put that into object mode, what will happen is it will uh, identify as an object and it will take the first two empty spots. In this particular case, it is spot 10, 11 and 12. And you can then essentially kind of use them as objects in your Dolby Atmos uh, workflow. Now you do not need to switch that in the Adobe Atmos Beam plugin. You can actually switch that around in the Composer plugin as well. So I have an object button here that is currently selected. And if I deselect that object button, it's going to turn that back into a composite. And I can even change the layout of the composite in the Adobe Atmos Composer plugin as well. Now you can obviously uh, automate all those parameters in the Adobe Atmos Beam plugin. So in particular, you can also automate the positional information of those objects, either as something that is routed into the uh, Adobe Atmos bed or composite or something that is routed into Adobe Atmos object. And the way the automation works is different from digital audio workstation to digital audio workstation. I'm not going to show that here, but if you want me to do a video, I can certainly do that. But it's fairly straightforward, whatever digital audio workstation you're using and uh, whatever workflow is necessary in order to automate these parameters, just apply them to the Dolby Atmos Beam plugin and it should work just fine. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the additional tracks to my Dolby Atmos setup and I'm probably going to switch back to a 7.1.2 just to be super... Traditional, let's call it that way. Uh, and uh, so um, in order to add the additional tracks, all I really need to do is go through each individual track that I want to route into the Adobe Atmos uh, Composer plugin and add a Adobe Atmos Beam instance. And whenever I add one, let me just close those, they will actually show up here. And uh, um, it actually remembered that I wanted a 9.1.6, but let's kind of switch them over to become objects. Right, so so let's just do that, and then do the same thing for the uh, snare, and let's add an instance of the Dolby Atmos Beam plugin, 
And we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to switch that to become an object. And uh, now we essentially have a 7.1.2 um, bed, a uh, very traditional 7.1.2 bed, uh, which holds the kick. And then we have uh, an object uh, that is a clap and an object that is a snare. So let's just have a brief listen on how that sounds. We, should, we now should hear everything with the exception of the synth. And then it works just fine. So let me just also add the synth and uh, let's add Adobe Atmos Beam plugin here as well. And let's also make that an object. And now essentially I have a 7.1.2 bed and I have uh, six objects, which are essentially three stereo pairs that are coming from the clap, the snare and the synth. So let's just have a listen on how that sounds. Now, obviously I now can move these things around. So let me just open up the Adobe Atmos Beam plugin here. To give it a little bit more depth. And once again, oh, that's, that's high. Let's just move this down. Now I did remember that I wanted a 9.1.6. So if you, are, if you are not kind of switching that over to 9.1.6, you will always see the uh, bad layout that you're using. Now, if you have paid close attention, you might have noticed that I don't have any information in the LFE channel. So this is now probably the time to talk about the LFE channel. Now, the LFE channel in Adobe Atmos setup is a little bit different to what in music production we consider a subwoofer. An LFE channel is exactly that. It is a low frequency effects channel uh, that is usually used for low frequency effects. However, we can use the LFE channel in Adobe Atmos music production by routing certain audio into the LFE. Now, in order to add an LFE channel, the only thing I really need to do is go into the Adobe Atmos Beam plugin. And here I have under LFE channel a selector that allows me to select which of the channels of the track on which the Adobe Atmos Beam plugin sits is going to become the LFE channel. Now, uh, if I do that for any of the tracks that I'm currently having, um, then obviously this, uh, this uh, track is uh, no longer going to be available for anything else. So what I'm going to do now is I'm simply going to add an additional track that will hold a copy of the kick in order to kind of provide some additional low end to the LFE channel. So let's do that. So uh, let me first close off this uh, Adobe Atmos Beam plugin here. And what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to add an additional track and I'm going to route the uh, kick into that uh, track. And let me just give that a name. Uh, let's maybe call that uh, LFE kick and let's give it a color. Uh, let's, let's make that brown. Okay. And then uh, what I need to do is, well, first of all, I need to um, make sure that I'm kind of not uh, sending all the audio in there. So I'd like to kind of turn it down a little. So <laughs> we will we'll see in a second why. Uh, I don't want to blow out your kind of speakers by kind of having <laughs> the audio too loud. Um, and then uh, essentially the same thing. I need to go to the LFE channel and I need to add a Dolby Atmos um, Beam plugin. And in the Beam plugin of the Kick channel, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first switch that to Mono, which essentially turns that into a Mono object. And then I'm going to route that Mono object into the LFE channel and that will now provide me with additional low end in the LFE channel. So let's play the audio. So let me just maybe turn on the and you can essentially hear that there's additional information coming in. And you also see that here in the input, the first channel is the LFE channel. If I turn that down, it disappears. If I turn that up, I can control it here. Now, if you're working with an LFE channel, be aware that the use of the LFE channel can be a little bit unintuitive in the Dolby Atmos Composer, and that is because of the way LFE channels are treated in Dolby Atmos in general. An LFE channel, once again, is not meant to be a subwoofer channel. 
Uh, so it's not really meant to be used in the way I've just used it here as uh, providing additional kind of sub-information for the kick. Uh, what is really meant to be used is for low frequency effects. And that means that if you're converting your Dolby Atmos into anything that doesn't really have a LFE channel, a dedicated LFE channel, the conversion will ignore the LFE channel. So if you're converting the Dolby Atmos project now down to stereo, for example, to simple 2.0, it will actually ignore the LFE channel. Um, only if you are rendering it in binaural, it will actually include the LFE channel. So if you're working with LFE channels, be aware that uh, the down mix to uh, formats that, does not, that do not have a dedicated LFE channel might not or should not actually include the LFE channel in the final signal. So let's talk about exporting the uh, Dolby Atmos project. And uh, before I do that, let me just clean up the uh, the Dolby Atmos here a little. Um, because I started out with a 9.1.6 uh, composite, it kind of remembered that. So let me just kind of switch that back to 7.1.2 uh, in order to make sure that we have a correct setup here. Now, the export in Dolby Atmos is something that most people get a little bit confused about because uh, what you are now really exporting is not a traditional audio signal that only includes channel-based information. It also includes the objects that you have in your Dolby Atmos project and it also includes the positional information. So the idea really is that, you, that you're exporting everything that goes into the Dolby Atmos composer into a file and then the endpoint device, so the consumer device, can take all this information and render it according to the speaker setup that you have in that particular endpoint device. And that essentially means that the final file that we're going to produce is actually not something that you can really play in a traditional audio your software, you would actually need a dedicated Atmos capable software in order to play those things. Um, and I'm going to show you in a second on how we can actually kind of make sure that the audio was, was exported correctly. But be aware that uh, when you export the um, Dolby Atmos um, production into a WAV file, uh, it is actually in a different format that includes all this additional metadata that allow endpoint devices to reconstruct the immersive experience. And with that being said, let's uh, see how that actually works. Now, in the Dolby Atmos Composer, there is this export section here. And this export section uh, asks me to set an in point and an out point. Um, so if I'm producing Dolby Atmos, I first need to tell the Dolby Atmos Composer where the audio starts and where the audio ends. And this, by the way, is completely identical to a traditional Dolby Atmos workflow. So if you're working with the Dolby Atmos renderer, you essentially have to do the same thing. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to let me First of all, move that endpoint here uh, out of the way in order to make sure that we can actually export correctly. So uh, I'm maybe going to set this to be my in point and then uh, essentially move the uh, thing here and set that to be my out point. So I'm going to now record from 22 seconds to uh, 7, well, sorry, for, from uh, point 0.22 seconds to, to 17 seconds and 12. And uh, uh, then I have a couple of different options. I can either play the audio or I can actually use the export function in the digital audio workstation, which is really nice because in a traditional setting, you would actually have to really play the audio. Now with the Dolby Atmos Composer, it actually allows you to access the same export through the regular rendering in your digital audio workstation, which is actually an additional advantage. Now, before I do that, uh, let me first go to the options. And in the options, I can select what I want to export. I can export the file as an ADM BWF, so that's a broadcast wave format file. That is the uh, extended version of a WAF file that I mentioned uh, earlier that includes not only the audio, but also all the metadata with the positional information of all objects and everything. And then I can also render it out uh, as uh, something that uh, has a, a multi-channel WAF file uh, in any of those speaker configurations. So for example, if you want to render out a 7.1.4 file, for, for example, I have a 7.1.4 audio system and I want to just check if, if everything sounds good, I can actually do that. So let me just maybe uh, render that out in stereo. And then I also have the possibility to render it out in a headphone mix. And uh, I can do the same thing here um, uh, as a multi-channel file, and I can select whether or not this is stereo or binaural. Um, let's just choose binaural here because I already have chosen stereo. And, and uh, if, you're, if you're working with higher channel counts, one thing that you might also want to do is you can actually kind of render them out as individual mono WAV files. That essentially means that if you have uh, 10 channels, for example, it will actually generate uh, a, a WAV file for each individual channel. 
Okay, with that out of the way, we can finally go to the export. And uh, for the export, what we need to do is we ne simply need to uh, click on the export button. And as soon as I do that, it will ask me to for a location where I want to export that. And let me just call the test. Going to save that. And now it says that it is ready. And that essentially means it's now waiting for me to export that file. And uh, I can once again either do that by simply playing the file now, by, by playing my, my, my project, or I can simply use the export function in FL Studio or any other digital audio version, whatever you're using. So let me just uh, do the second thing because that is a little bit faster. So I can say, let's export a WAV file here and let's, let's do that on the desktop. And um, this is sort of the name, Dolby Atmos Composer Demo. And let's just save that. And uh, then let's just start the rendering. And in addition to the rendering that FL Studio is doing, it's now also exporting the uh, files that I have chosen to be exported here in the options. So if I now go to my desktop, I should actually see all these individual files. So once again, I should see the uh, file that FL Studio produced. I should see the uh, ADM BWF uh, Dolby Atmos master file. And I should see the uh, two renders that I did. One render was a stereo render and the second one was the uh, binaural render for the headphone mix. So let's just check if that's actually on my uh, desktop. So let's close to it for a second. And uh, yes, here we have it. So essentially we have a binaural file, we have a stereo file. Those were the two that uh, were created through the Dolby Atmos Composer. We have the uh, file that, that FL Studio produced and we have the, and this one here is the important one, the uh, ADM BWF uh, Dolby Atmos master file. And I can now play that on whatever device I want to play it on. Now, uh, one thing I should mention is that the uh, there's one thing that the Dolby Atmos Composer cannot do that the Dolby Atmos Renderer can do, and that is that it cannot create, the Dolby Atmos Composer cannot create a uh, quality control deliverable, which is an MP4 file in a very particular um, coding schema that allows uh, Dolby Atmos capable systems to reconstruct the Dolby, the Dolby Atmos experience with a simple 5.1 a file and additional metadata. So you cannot do that with the Dolby Atmos Composer. For that, you would need the Dolby Atmos Renderer and you would load the master file into the Dolby Atmos Renderer and then essentially kind of export it as an MP4. However, you can, uh, as I said before, create all kinds of different formats with the Dolby Atmos Composer directly. So if you want to test out your file, simply create a multi-channel audio file and then test it on your system and you should be fine. Now you might wonder one thing and that is, I said that the master file, the ADM BWF, um, file that uh, was exported through the Dolby Atmos Composer is something that you cannot play in a simple audio player. So how do I actually know that everything works correctly? Well, Fiedler Audio thought about that and uh, they actually allowed you to import uh, master files into the Dolby Atmos Composer and check them out. So what we can do, for example, if we go to the options section here, there's an import button. So what we can do here is we can click on that import button and I can now simply import the test that once again is the Adobe uh, Atmos Master file that I just created and open that up. And if I'm open, opening that up, then the Dolby Atmos Composer turns into a player. I can now play that file and see if everything sounds good. And indeed it does. And if I want, I can re-render that. Now, if I'm loading a master file into the composer, it will play that master file. In order to get back to my production, what I need to do is I need to unload it. So if I'm clicking the unload button, the composer gets back to my original state and I can now continue working with uh, Dolby Atmos. Now, this by itself would already be pretty nice, but there's one additional feature that at the time uh, the Dolby Atmos Composer is being released is not yet accessible, however, which will come very, very soon. And that is the possibility to add uh, reverb through the Spacelab plugin from Fiedler Audio. And the basic idea really is that uh, if you have an object, for example, that is um, located in three-dimensional space, you also want to have reverb sometimes of that particular object. And that reverb should actually be a spatial reverb that is not located at the position of the object, but really kind of is something that surrounds you and is part of the entire space. So what you would normally do is, if you have an object and you want to add reverb to that object, you would route the reverb of that object into the Dolby Atmos bed so that you have the object as an object in Dolby Atmos and the, and the reverb in embedded in the bed of the Dolby Atmos project. And Spacelab allows us to do that once again 
at in any digital audio workstation, whether or not you are on a stereo digital audio workstation or a multi-channel digital audio workstation, it works exactly the same everywhere. And this is really nice. And uh, once again, this is not yet available. So um, the what I'm going to show you now is something that is going to become available soon. But I'm working with a late alpha, early beta version of uh, the next release of Space Lab. And uh, this actually kind of works really, really well. So let's have a look on how that uh, how that works. So what I'm going to do here is first of all let me let me get that out of the way here and let's go back into our mixer here and I'm going to add an additional track and let's call that track let's give that a name and a color and let's call that track space lab it's going to hold the reverb and let's give that a color I don't know yellow is nice and what I'm going to do is the only thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to add an instance of Spacelab. And uh, in my particular case, I'm actually going to use Spacelab Interstellar. So I have the full version of Spacelab, but it should work the same way with Spacelab uh, Ignition. So I'm going to uh, add an instance of Spacelab Interstellar. And uh, as soon as I do that, you see that uh, the Adobe Atmos Composer has identified this uh, Spacelab Ignition instance and it has added it to the connections. Now, once again, this is only available in the next version of Spacelab. So if you have a current version of Spacelab at the time of the release of the Adobe Atmos Composer, this will not show up yet. You will need to upgrade. This should come very, very soon. The fact that I'm playing around with it here and that Feedle Audio allowed me to actually kind of show that to you indicates that this is coming really, really soon. Um, so uh, just be aware of that. So if you if you are kind of uh, purchasing the Adobe Atmos Composer right after the video comes out, that is not working yet, but it will work soon. So what I'm going to do now is I'm simply going to add reverb to the clap, um, just as an example. And the way this is done is by switching out the Adobe Atmos Beam plugin with the corresponding Spacelab Beam plugin in order to make sure that the audio is not routed into the um, Adobe Atmos Composer directly, but is routed into the Spacelab reverb before it actually goes into the Adobe Atmos Composer. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go into the, the clap here and I'm going to simply exchange the Adobe Atmos Beam plugin. So let me just delete it maybe. And then let's add the Spacelab Beam plugin instead. Now Spacelab works a little bit different to the Adobe Atmos Composer in the sense that the sources that come from the Spacelab Beam plugins are not automatically added to the Spacelab plugin itself. So I actually need to manually do that. Now in order to do that, what I need to do is I need to go to this little cogwheel here and in the cogwheel here in the input, I'm going to select that particular Beam plugin. And that's the, uh, the, the clap plugin here. So let's just select that. As soon as I have that, this uh, Beam plugin is now connected to Spacelab and this is then kind of feeding the audio into the Dolby Atmos Composer. So let's just hear how that sounds. And you can actually already hear that there is a reverb going on with the clap. So let me just turn off the kick, maybe the other, the other ones. So you essentially hear the, the reverb. Now currently the reverb is in stereo, but I actually want to have that in the proper channel configuration of my bad track. And that in my particular case here was a 7.1.2 track. So what I need to do is I need to go into the Dolby Atmos Composer and simply switch out the format from stereo to Dolby Atmos 7.1.2. And that will then create um, a 7.1.2 reverb in my Beam plugin. So let's just kind of see how that sounds. Let me go back here. And if I go into the Adobe Atmos Composer, I actually see here, let me go back to the monitoring, I see that I have action on all channels, with the exception of the LFE channel, obviously, because the reverb doesn't really have a low frequency effect. Now, this configuration has one additional trick that I think makes it really ingenious. Now, currently what I have is I have the clap sent into the reverb and then this reverb sent into the Dolby Atmos Composer as part of the composite or the Dolby Atmos bed. But what I actually want to have is I want to have the object as an object and I want the reverb in the bed. Um, so I actually want to separate those two. 
And uh, the Dolby Atmos Composer allows me to actually do that. Um, and this is actually very, very simple. So let's have a look on how that, how that works. So let's open up the Dolby Atmos Composer. And the, uh, the trick is actually really, really simple. All I really need to do is I need to click on that object track here, on that object button. If, as soon as I click on that object button, what it will do is it will separate out the dry signal to become an object and the wet signal to become part of the bed. So let's let's click on that here, and I see that uh, sort of it has added these additional two objects, and it is now separating out the reverb and the object. In order to make sure that that's actually happening, let's have a listen on how what we have right now. And I see action on the input channel, so I can actually mute, for example, the the, the composites. Then I only have the dry signal. I cannot mute the objects, and I only have the wet signal. And I've separated out the object from its reverb and I can control the spatial nature of the reverb by just controlling the object. And this is super convenient and uh, exceptionally easy to do and is one of the most ingenious things of this entire configuration, which I believe that if you get the Dolby Atmos Composer at some point, you probably should get the Space Lab reverb as well. So this is really everything I wanted to say today. Once again, the last part uh, about Spacelab is something that uh, requires an upgrade to the Spacelab plugin. I'm assuming it's going to be a free upgrade, but I'm not completely sure. Um, at the time of the release of the Dolby Atmos Composer, that is not available yet. I was working with a late alpha, early beta version of that plugin, but it should become available soon. So by the time you're watching that video, it might already be available. So what's my final verdict? Well, you might have noticed that I'm really excited about that product because it really makes Dolby Atmos accessible for everybody. Um, this is a very unique plugin that really has the potential to disrupt what we do. Regardless of digital audio extension, um, you can now do Dolby Atmos without any limitations whatsoever. Ever. If you are working with anything that can only do stereo, you can still do 9.1.6 uh, reverb tracks uh, and export that in full Dolby Atmos glory. Um, if you're working on Windows, you can now work with Dolby Atmos that you couldn't do before. Uh, it makes it accessible to anybody. Once again, I even tried it with Plogby Dual and it worked perfectly. So what Fiddler Audio did here is really ingenious. I'm actually a little bit surprised that nobody else did that before them. Um, but uh, in my personal opinion, if you have any interest in Dolby Atmos or any interest in the future of immersive audio, really, this is something that you absolutely need. There's, there's no way around that. Um, and best of all, it is really inexpensive, uh, which is surprising. Even the full version of the Dolby Atmos Composer is cheaper than the Dolby Atmos Renderer from Dolby directly, even though it can do more than the Dolby Atmos Renderer can do. So my recommendation is to simply try it out and see if Dolby Atmos is for you. And if it is, uh, there's absolutely no excuse anymore to not get into Dolby Atmos because regardless of digital audio workstation, you can now do Dolby Atmos. Now, once again, if you have any questions or comments, please use the comment section below or join my Discord community. Email link is in the description below. And with that being said, see you at the next video.